Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 3, verses 13 through 19, and chapter 4, 14 through 19. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that we lay down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. But this we shall know, that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. That ends our reading. Today, I'd like to begin with a physics lesson. First, I want to talk about the law of the pendulum. Does anyone here know what I Well, as simple as I can, I'm going to share with you what it is. Here it is. A pendulum can never return to a point higher than the point at which it was released. Because of friction and gravity, when the pendulum returns, it will always fall short of its original release point. As a result, each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until finally it's at rest. And this point where it's at rest is called the state of equilibrium. Equilibrium, where all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. Now this book, How to Speak to You, if you pastor Ken Davis, describes how he used the law to complete an assignment in his college speech class. He writes about the assignment from that class. He says, the class would be graded on their creativity and ability to drive home a point in a memorable way. He prepared a tall title. Guess what? The Wall of the Pendulum. He spent 20 minutes meticulously teaching the physical principle that governs a swinging pendulum. After carefully teaching the law, he set up a demonstration. He attached a three-foot string to a child's toy top and secured it to the top of the blackboard with a thumbtack. He pulled the top to one side and made a mark on the blackboard where he let it go. Each time it swung back, he made a new mark on the blackboard. It took less than a minute for the top to complete its swinging and to come to rest. When he finished the demonstration, 
The markings on the blackboard prove his thesis. He says, then I asked how many people in the room believed the law of the pendulum was true. He said, all my colleagues raised their hand, and, and so did the teacher. He started to walk in the front of the room as a teacher, thinking that the presentation was over. In reality, it had really just begun. Hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room, Ken had fashioned a large crew of functional pendulum. He used about 250 pounds of metal weights tied to four strands of 500 pound test parachute cord. He brought the pen, it was about 250 pounds of metal up to his nose, a pendulum that he had made. Holding the huge pendulum just a fraction of an inch from the face of his teacher, who he had asked to get on a, a, a table, sit in a chair. Now imagine this, professor sitting there in a chair. Ken takes the pendulum, pulls it back. But wait a minute. He asked the professor if he believed the law of the pendulum. And he explained it one more time to the teacher. The teacher had applauded just the way the other members of his class had. So Ken said, if the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release the mass of metal, it will swing across the room and return short of the release point. And then he said the important words. Your nose will be in no danger. After that final statement of his law, Ken looked him in the eye and he asked, Sir, do you believe this law is true? There was a long pause. Huge beads of sweat formed on the teacher's upper lip. And then weakly, he nodded and whispered, Yes. Ken released the pendulum. It made a swishing sound as it raced across the room. At the far end of the swing, it paused momentarily and started back. Ken Davis said he never saw a man move so fast in his life than that professor. He literally dived from the table deftly stepping around the still swinging pendulum, Ken asked the class, does he believe in the law of the pendulum? What do you think they said? No. No. That's exactly what they said. No. Now we also asked for volunteers at that point. Anybody else want to try this? You want to come up and prove that it's wrong? No. Like that professor, our beliefs, our resolve, our faith are often challenged by fear. Fear, in fact, is a primary emotion like joy and anger. And it has negative and it has positive aspects. Just as a coin has two sides, heads and tails. It can keep us safe. But fear can also rob us of important experiences and relationships. It can keep us from developing dangerous relationships. So it's a guardrail. That's good. At the same time, it can be a roadblock that steals opportunity from us. Fear of the future is one of those fears that can cause significant stress and worry. Now, Jesus addressed worry in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew records it in chapter 6 of his, of his gospel, verses 34, I'm sorry, 33 and 34. Here Jesus tells us to get our priorities straight. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. And I love this one. This is my, my key mark, keystone uh, uh, verse. 
Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus teaches this at the conclusion of a passage that addresses concerns about food and well-being. He's teaching his followers that their focus, regardless of their age, should not be on themselves. However, I, I don't think he's suggesting an irresponsible attitude toward the future or saying don't plan for tomorrow. Instead, he's asking them and us to recognize a higher calling than preserving our future and our comfort. Having that kind of focus is what it takes to be a genuine Christian. Sometimes we get so focused on ourselves and our situation that our vision is clouded. A young father, father-to-be actually, was pacing back and forth in the hall, wringing his hands in the hospital corridor while his wife was in labor. He was tied up in knots, knots of fear and anxiety. Beads of perspiration were, were dripping from his brow and revealed the agony of his suffering. Finally, at 4 a.m., a nurse popped out of a door and said, well, sir, you have a little girl. He dropped his hands and became limp and said, Oh, how I thank God it's a girl. She'll never have to go through the awful agony I've had all night. Think about that, folks. Think about that. Any of you women want to say anything? This is the time. Because dad kind of lost perspective, didn't he? We lose sight of the long view, whether it's a month, a year, a day, or even an eternity, because worry and fear consume us. Because we lose perspective, Lamentations 3 is relevant to our future. Chapter 3, verse 40. We must search and examine our ways we must return to the Lord, it says. That direction is also what the epistles call us to. It's why the Oxford Holy Club did their daily examination. In John's first letter, he writes, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. To be sure, the passage deals with fear focusing not on salvation, but on punishment. Nevertheless, for John, it indicates that fearing the future is more focused on loss, the negative, than on gain. John and Charles Wesley believed in, and taught that for members of the Methodist movement, that they needed to focus on the big stuff, the important stuff. What Methodists set apart what, what set apart Methodists from others, other expressions of Christianity, was Christian perfection. Now, how do you define Christian perfection? Does that mean we're living a perfect life? And you've heard me say uh, before, many of you, that every United Methodist pastor, every Methodist, Methodist pastor, it has to go through the examination in front of the annual conference and answer publicly the 25 questions that, Cha that John Wesley put all of his preachers through, and it's still a part of our doctrine. And one of those questions is, do you expect to reach, earthly perfection, or to reach perfection in this earthly life? And the answer for all, everybody who are being ordained needs to be yes. Now there's also, there's also another question there, a part of that 25. One of them is, are you in debt so as to embarrass yourself? And usually the answer to that anymore is no. It used to be that way. Some superintendents may, may explain that away by saying, yeah, some of us embarrass easier than others do. But the reality is no preacher pays for a college and a seminary education 
without significant debt. No student, for that matter, does. Well, that's beside the point. What's Christian perfection? I mean, that's really the question for us and for preachers. Well, the Wesleys define Christian perfection as a purity of intention, dedicating all of our life to God. It's giving God all our heart, our desires, and design ruling all of our tempers. It's the devoting, not a part of, but all of our soul, body, and substance to God. In another view, it's all the mind which was in Christ, enabling us to walk as Christ walked. It's the circumcision of the heart from all filthiness, all inward as well as outward pollution. It's a renewal of the heart in the whole image of God, the complete likeness of him that created us. And in yet a third understanding, elaborating on this, it's the loving God with all of our heart and our neighbor as we love ourselves. All these definitions reflect St. Paul's own confession of Christian perfection. We find that in Romans 7, to 24. He says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. The power makes me a slave to the sin, to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life dominated by sin and death? And in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, Paul reassures his hearers and readers. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of all uh, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin of sin that leads to death. Letting fear get the best of us, whether for a medical procedure, a move to a new location, or anything else, is like any other sin. It tempts us. Trusting in the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us, resist the pulls of our self-oriented nature that pulls us to fear, and it will help us overcome fear. Now let's go back to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So what's the point of truth about the law of the pendulum? No one would take the risk to end, uh, to the end of the experiment. They did not believe what was already proven, proven even in front of their very eyes. They allowed their fear and their doubt to dominate their behavior. Despite knowing the law of the pendulum and having it demonstrated, they acted out their fear and they gained a powerful insight about themselves. Think about it. What happens when you come to the place where you doubt what you say you believe because you realize you're not living it out? That's a powerful understanding. Jesus tells us, Scripture tells us that all sin, all sin, and come short of God's glory. Every one of us. Now, when you fear the worst will happen, your thoughts may bring it about. So so let me close with a wonderful story illustrating how fear can keep us from doing God's will. Someone once wrote, fear is the wrong use of imagination. It's anticipating the worst, not the best, that can happen. So a salesman is driving out in a lonely country road one dark night, and it's raining. He has a flat tire. He opens his trunk. Guess what he finds? No lug wrench. 
Ever had that happen to you? I see some head shaking, yeah. Well, remember I said it was a dark night on a country road. There are a lot of, not a lot of houses around. The light from a farmhouse could be seen from a distance down the road. So the salesman sets out on foot through the driving rain. Surely the farmer would have a lug wrench he could borrow. But it was late at night. The farmer would be asleep in his warm, dry bed. Maybe he wouldn't answer the door. And even if he did, he'd be angry at being wakened up in the middle of the night. The salesman, picking his way blindly in the dark, stumbled on. By now, his shoes and his clothing were soaked. Even if the farmer did answer his knock, he would probably shout something like, What's the big idea waking me up at this hour? This thought made the salesman angry. What right did the farmer have to refuse him the loan of a lug wrench? After all, he was stranded in the middle of nowhere, soaked to the skin. The farmer was a selfish clod, no doubt. No doubt about it. The salesman finally reached the house and banged loudly on the door. A light went on inside, and a window opened above. A voice called out, who is it? His face white with anger, the salesman called out, you know darn well who it is. It's me, and you can keep your blasted lug wrench. I wouldn't borrow it now if you had the last one on earth. Like this weary traveler, some of us allow our fear and worry and imagination to consume us. Consequently, we deny God's presence in our lives. We can get so wrapped up in our fear, fear of change, fear of the unknown, fear of the possible consequences of a medical procedure or any other choice that lands in our lives, that we will help the disaster happen. Scripture assures us that if we put God first in our decisions, if we put God first in our decisions about life, about church, about the future, God will be faithful to his word. Now, I have to warn you that he doesn't promise that it will be an easy road to travel. The future for any of us could be painful and have unintended consequences. But our loving God promises to be at our side every step of the way. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us when we give in to fear. And we don't want to have to deal with change, so we get stuck in, we dig in, almost like digging a foxhole in a war. And because we do, we can't advance. We can't move to the next blessing, to the next possibility. Lord, help us not to fear what comes next, but to plan for it. Help us to live full lives, grounded in you, serving others, loving you. Lord, we don't want to die in this, in this foxhole. So give us the courage to climb out and face the future with assurance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
The hymn is number 